Praise God. Praise the Lord, everybody. How many is glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Amen. How many of you folks still got the turkey blues this morning? Yeah. I think we all just about overdid ourselves. And uh, let me just speak for myself. I, I, my uh, sweet daughter-in-law and her family, our house is kind of unique. My wife is not known as a cook. And uh, there's a reason for that. Uh, she can't cook. Uh, and she will be the first to admit it. I haven't, I haven't transgressed anything. She will tell you. That's, that's not her forte. Now, she does other things, you know, nobody else can do. But cooking, no. Just, you know. If it wasn't for a microwave, we'd starve in our house. I'll tell you right now. Anyhow, the Lord allowed my son to find a beautiful girl who knows how to cook. And not just cook, but that, that southern Louisiana stuff. That just, you know, puts the Creole sauce in your life. You know, you feel real good about it. And so they fixed up a big meal. I'm talking turkey and dressing and, and all the trimmings and pies. I thought they never would quit bringing pies in the house and all this stuff. And they all brought it to our house. So we ate there. We had some other guests come in and just had a big Thanksgiving Day meal and watched a little football and cried about that. You know how it goes. And it's, it's all okay, though. But uh, just a great day of Thanksgiving. And so we're kind of walking around today just a little sluggish. I speak for myself. I'm trying to find that other gear because I ate too much. If I were to be an honorable man, I would preach to you this morning against the consequences of gluttony <laughs> because that's exactly what happened last Thursday at my house. But to God be the glory. We're here today and we're having a good time in the house of the Lord. If you love the Lord today, I want you to just give a big hand clap of praise right now and just bless the Lord. Praise God, praise God, praise God. I would bring your attention to scripture this morning, and you may remain seating, rather a lengthy reading, but to the book of Luke chapter 15 and verse 11, a very familiar story to us all, but I would read it to you quickly here from the word of the Lord, Luke 15, 11. <clears throat> and he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance <clears throat> with righteous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. And when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. 
and they began to be merry. Our pastor has been preaching to us for the past several weeks regarding the vision of this church, the purpose of the church, our measurements, everything you repeated off of the screens a few moments ago, giving us direction as to what this house should be all about. For too long we have considered church to be for us, and we came to get our shout on. We came to get our fuel to take us through another week, and all that's good as long as we realize the true purpose of us being in the church. And this morning I want to preach to you for just a few moments the importance of keeping the house. The importance of keeping the house. On June the 5th, 2002, a beautiful 14-year-old girl lay sleeping with her younger 10-year-old sister. Her world was peaceful, exciting, well provided for. The proverbial horn of plenty could well describe the lifestyle of this beautiful, sweet 14-year-old. She was secure, she was safe, she was adored by her father. She had a very doting mother that took care of everything in her life. She was almost worshiped by her grandparents. Her world literally couldn't be any better. She was a harpist, a musician, brilliant school record, upper class young lady, was reared in a Christian environment, knowing no fear. Everybody loved her. She was the special child. Little did she realize that night as she lay down to sleep and she pulled the covers up over her red pajamas that within just a few moments, her world would be turned literally upside down. With a knife in one hand, a transient, a demon-possessed man who considered himself to be a man of God would break into her bedroom, kidnap her as her little sister watched, frozen in terror and horror, so scared, not knowing what to do, she could not even scream. Her family would wake up the next morning and realize that this beautiful daughter had been kidnapped from her own bed. There were no clues. There were no identifying witnesses. Even the little sister could not tell them what happened or who took her sister in the midnight hours. The family would now enter into a man-made hell, if you please, that would impact their lives forever. As police looked and found nothing, no one would see anything. No one could do nothing. There was only one thing that this family could do. Their daughter was missing. No one knew anything about it. The only thing they could do would be to pray. And pray they did. After prayer, after seeking the face of God, in a press release, the family presented the following statement. We will not live in fear. We are watching. We are united. We are praying. We will never give up. We are all family. In that one statement, they were saying this. We're not leaving. We're not moving from this house. Her room stays as it is because one day Elizabeth will come home. We will live for that day 
until she comes home. And that was their resolve. That was their purpose. That was their mission. That was their vision. This is where they were to live. When I read back in the chapter of Luke 15, beginning at verse 11, which I read in your hearing earlier, Jesus told the story that we've come to know as the parable of the prodigal son. A young man who at a certain time decided it was time to explore the world. And to do that, he would go demand of his father, I want what is mine. I'm leaving home. The father divided the goods between the young man and his brother. And I could go into great detail this morning on how the young man wasted his life, how he threw it away, how he defrauded himself by moving into a far country, the Bible said, one that was a long ways from the place that he knew he would be living, not just geographically, but emotionally, spiritually, He made an incredible transition in his life, and it wasn't for the better. It was for the worse. I could speak imaginative this morning of he did not inquire of his father and ask his father's feelings or ask his father's wisdom about the decision. He simply demanded, give me. Give me mine. I want what belongs to me. He was tired of his father's government, tired of his father's rules, tired of his regulations. He was tired of daddy telling him, you're going to church today. He was tired of being told when you get there, don't just sit there like a knot on the log, but worship God with the rest of us. Told, put your phone up. Get your mind on God. Get that phone turned off. Oh, I could go on this morning. He was tired. Daddy telling him when he walked out of the house with his blue jeans draped under his behind, saying, get those pants up. You don't walk out of here looking like that. He was tired of somebody telling him how, what, when, and where. He was going to make it on his own. Tired being told how to dress. Tired what time to come in. Oh, he was tired. He was going to be something special. He was tired of his father's eyes because his father's eyes seemed to always see what, who, when, and where before anybody else knew anything. He was distrustful of his father's finances, resources, I don't know if dad's really going to give me my share or not. So he wanted to make his own investments and build his own portfolio. So he created, would want to create his own financial empire. So he goes to his father and demands it all. And his father gave the young man his inheritance, but he gave it to him with kindness, not approval. Son, this is yours. Take it. Understand the Bible does not go into great detail. It just simply says that he spent all he had. Spent all. And when it was spent, that there arose a mighty famine in the land. And then the verse closes out by saying, and he began to be in want. He wanted Realizing he's now broke, there's a famine prevalent, he joins himself to a citizen of that country. He literally gave himself to the devil. Why would I dare call this citizen a devil? I'll tell you why. He knew that this was a Jewish boy. He knew about the teachings of abstinence of the Jews. And yet he gave him a job and a way to provide for himself by putting him in a position of taking care of things that he was forbidden to partake of for his Judaism, 
forbid him to eat pork. But now he would eat with and take care of that which had been taught all his life he could not digest, pork. When the devil drags you out and drags you down, he laughs at you all the way. In fact, the devil of this far country gave him the job, gave him the husk off the corn which was intended to feed the swine. And the Bible said this, that during all this stuff, he looks around and he sees the fat pigs. He sees the slop. He sees the muck, the mire. And the Bible said he came to himself. What am I doing here? What put me in this place? My father has servants at home that have more than this. What am I thinking? But then he also realized it's a long way back. It's a long way back. But when he came to himself, that distance didn't matter. He was going to go home. So as he goes back, his head hanging low, he sees the house in the distance. The Bible said when he was a great way off, he saw the house. And standing on the front porch of that house, I can see his father, who had been coming out on that porch every day since he left, looking into the absolute nothingness of a road bleached with heat, waiting to see that sun coming home. And all of a sudden, his father sees what appears to be a silhouette in the far distance, making its way, slumped shoulder, dragging his feet through the heat coming up off the road, but he's coming back home. He's not the proud, arrogant young fool that left but he is now the bent, broken young man who has nothing. But his father, looking at him, waiting, longing for his son, looked at him with eyes of mercy. When he was afar off, the Bible said, he saw him. He met him with a heart of mercy. He didn't accuse him. He didn't reprimand him, just gave him compassion. May I tell you something I hope you never forget. If you find yourself in a place to make judgment on someone that you've talked to and they fall, don't ever use the most ridiculous four words that could come out of your mouth. I told you so. Anybody ever been told that? I told you so. That did so much good, didn't it? It didn't, didn't do anything, nothing. He met him with feet of mercy. He ran to his son. His boy was dragging, but his father ran to him. His father ran to him with words of encouragement. He met him with arms of mercy. He fell on that boy's neck, began hugging that boy. He met him with lips of mercy. He kissed him. He not only showed forgiveness toward his son, but he also sealed that pardon with a kiss, just like David did with Absalom, knowing that Absalom was trying to destroy his kingdom. David still received him and hugged him and loved him. The father didn't write him off. The father didn't say he'll never be back. No, that father had been keeping his room. All the time the father was gone, dad was keeping the house, putting fresh paint on the walls. The boy's coming home and he's not going to come back to a pigsty. He's coming back to a beautiful place. He's going to walk in his room and there's going to be some things in there that's going to bring back great memories. My boy will come home. The young girl's daddy 
we're keeping her room ready because Elizabeth will be back home. Back home. Nine months from the time that that girl was taken from her house. Nine months later, America's most wanted, the FBI, local authorities, government agencies were saying, it's over. There's no way she'll be found. You might as well move on with your life. Your daughter will never return home. She'll never be seen again. But yet the family kept saying, keep the house. Keep her room just like it was when she left it. She will be back. They kept repeating the prayer and the statement they had made at the very beginning. We will not live in fear. We're watching. We're waiting. We're united. We're praying. We'll never give up. We are all family. Waiting. Some interested citizen saw a familiar picture. Dial 911. Within minutes, this demon possessed Jesus pretender who literally called himself Emmanuel, meaning God with us. Brian David Mitchell is seen with two women, one older and one about 15 years old. The police inquire of her and begin to talk to her. The young girl who is so brainwashed, mentally controlled, ruled by fear of her life, other factors that would yet be discovered, denies who she is. No, no, my name's not Elizabeth. My name is Augustine. That's who I am. Finally, she gives in to the police insistence that her name is Elizabeth. And then she said something rather strange. If thou sayest, I sayest. Spoke a crazy language. So brainwashed. So removed from reality. Confused. Abused. Captive. Innocence gone, psychologically scarred for life. Elizabeth stood there. She looked at her, the police. If that's who you say I am, then that's who I am. But wait just a minute. There's, there's still a dad and a mom that when they bring her back to them, they see her and say, the house is still here. The room is just like it was. There'll be no questions, no inquiries. You just come on back home. We're going to protect you. We're going to take care of you. We're going to give you time to heal. We're going to give you time to recover. And her father begins to declare, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. A miracle. Only God could have brought her back. She had been seen at one time, <clears throat> eight miles from her home. And she recognized she was in a place of familiarity. But yet she couldn't say anything. And someone saw her and thought that might be, but didn't say anything. An English statesman said one time, all it takes for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. I want you to understand that this house, this central triad church, we refuse to do nothing. As a people, we refuse just for church to be for us. But I can't help but wonder how many have wandered and are lost today that are looking for somebody to say, come home. Come home. Come home. 
the hardest part for a backslider or a sinner or someone who does not know God, the hardest part for them to find God is making it into the church, wondering how we will receive them. The longest walk that you may make today will be from where you're sitting to an altar. It's the longest mile you'll ever walk right there. That's what the devil wants to tell you. When actually, it's a very short trip to find the greatest amount of happiness that you'll ever have in your life. Just when you come home. Pastor, I thank you for teaching us our responsibilities and what we're really here for, our purpose, our vision, our mission. You see, at this house, nobody has a past, only a future. When you make that commitment in the altar, I don't care where you've been, what you've done, I don't even want to know. All I can tell you is from this moment on, you are a child of the King. You're my brother. You're my sister. I'm going to love you like I've loved none other. I will fight for you when all of hell is fighting you. I will stand for you until we all bleed. Because you're part of the family of God. And hear me well today. There's no greater family on this earth than the family of God. Somebody has been keeping the house. Somebody's been waiting on you. I want you to bow your head with me just a moment right now. Father, I'm asking you to speak to our hearts today to let us realize that no matter how far we may have gone, we can always come home. I'm asking God that you would speak to those who are in a valley of desperation, decision, have been contemplating a lot of things. I'm asking, Lord, that you would bring them home. Prepare our hearts, God, to receive, to feed, to put on a new robe, a ring, new shoes, whatever, God, to make them know they're part of your family. Let your church be consumed with compassion and love and mercy and not with judgment. Not, oh God, with accusation, but Lord, give us a heart full of love like we've never known before. I ask you to do all this in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen and amen.